Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I have had the absolute privilege over the past seven years of working with an incredible bunch of people who are some of the most honest, the funniest, most courageous and most challenging people I have ever worked with. They are our young homeless people in Tunbridge Wells. And over the past seven years, I've worked with in excess of 100 of those people as I've done my work. And for many hours, I've sat at a table and conversed with and created with and cooked with and really encouraged this amazing bunch of 16 to 25 year old young people and many of whom are already parents. The inspiration became, behind this talk came about five years ago when, um, because I get to know the girls a lot, my family also get to know them, as when the young girls move into their own accommodation, we often invite them for dinner with us as a family. And we do that because, and my colleagues do that too, because there are so many of them who don't have a blueprint of what family truly looks like. And I'm not saying our family's perfect, but we function and we eat together. And so that's what we do. We invite the young people to eat with us as a family. And this one occasion, five years ago, we, um, my children were five and three. And the dress code at that time for dinner was a poncho. And our little one used to just knock his drinks all over the place. And our guest got wet. And people were talking over each other to be heard. And it was chaotic, you know, it was just chaos. And this young girl looked at me as I've got my head in my hand going, why did I think this was a good idea? And she said, this is crazy. And I said, I know. And so I said, so tell me what were mealtimes like in your home when you were growing up? And she said, um, sat in front of the telly with the tray on my lap. And she went on to say that that meal time that she had with us was the first time that she'd ever eaten with a family. And she was 19. And I was really shocked by that because there are so many memories that I have, and I'm sure we all have, when we come together in family to celebrate and create things and have happiness and to converse with, and also to grieve with. And she had never experienced that. She, I knew at that moment, may not be the only child to have had mealtimes alone and the only one to realise that the table rather than a TV was the centre of the home. And for many of us it is because it's the place where we share and we eat and we create and we debate and it's the place where our young people find their minds and their voices. I am not a great cocktail party girl. I don't do small talk really very well at all because I'm not good with the, I'm fine, I'm fine. I want to know how you really are. I love dinner parties and I want to be able to sit and see the truth of life in your eyes and to talk. I want to know if you're fine and I want to know how you really are. And I think back to the day before um, my mum's funeral and as a family we were gathered together in grief and the priest came in and he said, Whilst you don't know it now, I know it now. You, as a family, you're going to survive this and you are going to be okay. And he was right. He said, a family that comes together in grief is always okay. I think about a young person who came to my room in grief. She'd been in our project for a couple of months already and she used to bring anger into the room. She never brought words, just anger. She sat really angrily. And for two months, she sat with us and didn't say anything. And one day, she was waiting for me at the door of our project, and she didn't look happy. And I said to her, how are you? How are you today? You don't look like you've had a good week. And she said, you could say that. Um, the guy who I thought was my dad, he screamed at me last night that he wasn't my dad, and my real dad died last year. She'd already lost her mum. So in that moment, she was telling us that she was now an orphan. And then everyone else from the project came in. And so for her in that moment, vulnerability wasn't an option. So for the next two hours, she sat 
holding onto the table in silence, knowing that at some point we would be there to walk through her pain and talk through her pain. And we did. In preparation for this talk, I put a shout out to all my friends and family and said, please, please, please take a photo of your dining table right now. Wherever you eat, take a photo of it right now. Don't tidy up. Please don't tidy up. I want a snapshot of your lives. So there were teenagers studying. There were people working, teachers marking books. There were charity clothes ready for the charity shop. There was menu planning. There was children's creativity and chocolate, discarded cameras and maps from city trips. There were floral decorations of love, there were tea parties, Lego battles, bunting making, there was peace and calm. It was beautiful, for me it was beautiful because it just showed a snapshot of everyone's lives in that moment. It also brought sadness to me because I thought there are so many young people in our society who don't have access to that. Because since that first encounter with that young person five years ago at our dinner table, I've asked many homeless people, where did you eat when you were growing up? Where did you have your dinner? And in about 70% of the cases that I've spoken to, many of them said, on my lap in front of the telly, or in my room, or stood at the kitchen worktop, or dinner. And I knew then that this isn't an isolated thing. And you always hope that when you come across something distressing like that, that it is going to be isolated, but it's not. So I spoke with some youth workers and some family liaison officers in our, the most challenging of our um, environments today and said, what's happening in the rooms, in the houses that you're going into? And many of them said, there's no table, or the table's there, but it doesn't appear to be being used to eat together. And I know it's really tough, you know, many of us find it really tough in order to come together to, to eat. We have really busy lives. Something that we do um, as a family, which we don't do every day, but it's something we love to do, and we call it share the day, and that's what we, we, we get in after school and after work, and we grab a drink, and we grab a snack, and we sit at the table, and we share the day. And I love the fact that now we're no longer wearing ponchos, that my children are old enough to say, mummy, how was your day? And they're often the first to ask it, how was your day? And there are parts of my day that I can't share, and I can say, mm, I've had a tough day. But there are parts of my day that I can, as can they. And there's a pocket where we sit together and we share in each other's excitements and challenges and the encouraging things that have happened during the day. And I learn from them and I hope that they learn from me. There's been so much research done into eating together that I've come across since experiencing that first meal time five years ago. In 2013, The Telegraph published that only 13% of people sit down daily to eat at the table. And if you say, well, why should we? You know, why should we make space for something as simple as just eating together? And I'll tell you why. We were in um, some training just a few weeks ago. I know there were some people here who were in that same training. And someone ch um, really shared some challenging statistics with us. And we are people who work with young people. And even we found these statistics challenging. They said this, they said, in an average class of 30 children, by the time they reach 16, 10 will have witnessed the separation of their parents. Three will have mental health problems. Eight will have suffered severe violence, abuse or neglect. Three will be living in step families. One will have experienced the death of a parent and seven will have been bullied. If all of that is happening in our children's lives, then I say we make space to hear about it. Because if our children aren't one of those statistics, our children's peers will be. And if they don't have someone to share it with, then bring them to our table. We might not have children or we might live alone, and so in business, why should we work together in business to make eating together a reality? Harvard Business School conducted some research that investigated why, how, when people eat together whilst negotiating, 
versus people who don't eat together what the results were. Those who did eat together whilst negotiating delivered substantially better profitability than those who didn't. Google feed everybody for free, all their employees for free, and that would be lovely. But have we ever considered in business just stopping, maybe even just once in the week, and coming together with our colleagues to eat? Because for many of those colleagues, that might be the only time in the week <coughs> that they eat at a table. That yearbook of 2011, the statistics of those young children in our schools, they are tomorrow's colleagues. They are our responsibility. If we call ourselves leaders, if we call ourselves game changers, or if we want to be, then I would encourage every one of you, whether it's in homes, in business, in schools, or in society, if we are eating at a table, please encourage someone else to come to your table. Come, sit, and eat at the table. Thank you.